And hi guys, as we said, my name is Caitlin Tiffany. I'm a master's student at NC State University. And today I'm going to be presenting my research on enhancing collaborative wildlife conservation across the Southeastern United States. And this is uh, my thesis research. So you're kind of gonna be getting a little bit of a defense here, but a little more casual. Bear with me. So we're gonna start with a little, little bit of background first. Wildlife management in the Southeastern United States is traditionally managed state by state, where migratory and endangered species are managed by the federal government and each state has a fish and wildlife agency that takes care of the critters within their borders. Within the Southeast, we have the Southeastern Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, which I'll refer to as SIAFWA. Um, although I hear folks in, in Louisiana last summer telling me it's pronounced CIFWA, so we can argue about that during the Q&A session. But SIAFWA is composed of 15 states and two territorial fish, state fish and wildlife agencies. And SIAFWA is a regional division of AFWA, the National Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. So the Southeast in particular faces challenges that don't make sense to manage um, within state boundaries alone. We have species that have multi-state ranges. We have to maintain healthy wildlife populations with lots of urban sprawl that's only getting bigger. We have to adapt to climate change threats, and we also need to serve the needs of diverse populations. So if you look at the makeup of several um, advisory boards for state fish and wildlife agencies in the Seattle region, we see that there's definitely an opportunity here to change the field a little bit and better reflect the stakeholders that we're trying to serve. Um, these are all commissioner boards, and if you look at them, they're pretty homogenous. Uh, we have a lot of people that look very similar in age, uh, gender, and race. Let's just keep that in mind moving forward. So switching gears a little bit, I wanted to talk about collaborative conservation and give you kind of a starting definition for what a collaborative conservation would look like. So collaborate, collaborative conservation is any process that's going to bring together diverse stakeholders when they can collectively manage natural resources with the goal of enabling people in those places to thrive both now and in the future. So an example of a collaboration could include um, NGOs like Ducks Unlimited, Delta Waterfowl, uh, government organizations like the National Park Service and North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, and then some private organizations like Bass Pro Shops, REI, other things. So it doesn't just have to be collaboration between government entities, universities, or the same type of people. Looking into regional collaborations a bit more, there's a lot of possible benefits. You can maximize the impact of your resources when you're working together. You can spread out costs and produce large scale results. You can do lots of large scale knowledge sharing and creation, and you can manage species and resources at a landscape level. By the same token, there's also some drawbacks. Uh, large scale collaborations often require lots of logistical support, a lot of coordination, that it can be time consuming and then you have to balance out organizational missions and goals and try to figure out how you can get different agencies to jive with the same goals but slightly different ways of doing things. And then finally, there are always limits on how our funding can be spent. So a little bit more background, most of you are probably familiar with state wildlife action plans. These form the basis of a lot of my research. Um, so if you look at the state wildlife action plans, they are plans required by the federal government for states to get matching dollars for conservation. So there's eight core elements to the state wildlife action plans and each state has to submit a swap, I'll refer to it as swaps, a swap plan with something addressing each of these goals. And they're currently in a revision, so things might change. So my big research objectives here, I wanted to identify practitioners priorities for regional collaborations, specifically uh, leadership and boots on the ground wildlife professionals in the Southeast. I wanted to describe the extent of current collaborations and try to gauge interest in future collaborations, characterize the perceived benefits and barriers to those collaborations, and then determine the state of collaborations around diversity, equity, and inclusion in particular. And in doing this, I wanted to describe the key players in these collaborations, and particularly those that are operating in a cross-state manner. And I did this with the social network analysis that I'm very excited to share with you. So diving in a little bit, um, I'm in social science, so I loved a survey. We did a Qualtrics survey of wildlife practitioners uh, between September 22 and January 2023. This primarily evaluated collaboration topics required by the state wildlife action plans, but we also looked at who was collaborating across state lines and 
what their perceptions were of how these collaborations were going. We received, received 751 responses, 409 of which were completed. Um, and the survey went out to over 6,000 email addresses. We sent it through state chapters of the Wildlife Society and the Southern Division of the American Fisheries Society. We pretested all of our qu questions with the CECAS lead coordination team and the Climate Change and Swap Working Group. So there were several iterative processes of trying to refine these questions and goals to make sure that we were asking what we wanted to ask. So without further ado, let's talk about regional collaboration and wildlife conservation. My first objective um, is to identify practitioners' priorities for regional collaborations. We broke this down into seven core elements that we wanted to test, um, most of which were derived directly from the swaps, but two or three of which came from other things brought up with our pre-testing with those folks we talked about earlier. So our first one, we wanted to see how people feel about describing threats to species in their habitats. How do they feel about proposing and prioritizing conservation actions for species of concern? How do they feel about increasing the likelihood of conservation success for those species specifically with multi-state ranges? We wanted to measure the effectiveness of proposed conservation actions, developing plans to adapt conservation actions to climate change in particular, protecting additional land for conservation to improve connectivity, and then working with diverse stakeholders to make wildlife conservation more relevant. So my first survey item, I asked folks on a seven point Likert scale, just how important are each of these things to you? Each of these priorities from one, not at all important to seven, it's extremely important. And then I also had a write in section for those people that felt super strongly about something that wasn't in those seven core priorities. Um, next, we had a question about current participation in regional collaborations to access, uh, I'm sorry, assess our second objective, which was describing the extent of current collaborations and future interest. And then we also had a scale question asking on a scale of not interested, somewhat interested, and very interested. How interested are you in participating in a regional collaboration in the future? And yes, it was a competition to see how many times we could say the word interested. For our third objective, characterizing perceived benefits and barriers, uh, we've compiled a list of potential benefits from collaborate, collaboration literature and discussion with those consult, consultations we did earlier. So we did have a short answer question where we asked folks what the biggest problems they faced were. And then we also had a list question with another Likert scale. Some of those key benefits we tested were sharing costs and saving money, sharing data and information, saving time, increasing the likelihood of conservation success for species with multi-state ranges, and then making my boss and agency happy. On the other hand, we also looked at barriers. We did have a short answer question asking folks what the biggest problems they faced when collaborating across state lines were, and a nice little section for them to write in. And then we had another Likert scale or, or four point scale asking folks from not a barrier to a major barrier, how much does this stop you from doing collaborations? And things, items we had on there were, it's too expensive, sharing data and information is too difficult. It doesn't lead to conservation success. It takes too long. The logistics are just too difficult. My boss or agency don't support it, or it stirs up controversy. So for the analysis on this, we started by testing for non-response bias. We did chi-square analysis, and we looked at um, early and late respondents. It was a wave analysis. We didn't see any big differences between these groups, so we went on ahead and we ran some descriptive statistics and t-tests. So for the t-tests, we broke it down into uh, group types. So we said, are there differences in respondents' opinions based on leadership, if you're an administration or if, if you're just a, you know, a field biologist? Are there differences based on how long you've been in the field? So less than 20 years and greater than 20 years. And that was actually when we split at the 50th percentile of the age distribution of respondents. Then we looked at gender, our results were, our, our respondents were primarily male. So we split it between male and then females, non-binary and other identifying folks were one category. And then finally we split by race, which again was largely white. So we did white and all other races. So who responded? Based on organization types, we had primarily state government agency personnel, 37%. Then we had a lot of university and extension, about a quarter. Federal agencies made up about 12% of respondents, and then the other about 20% were self-employed, for-profit NGOs, nonprofits, and that 5%, a lot of that was actually foresters. 
that didn't work for state agencies. So our respondents were about 70% male, about 30% female, 1% other. And then our mean age was about 47 years old. The median was also 46 and a half. So pretty, pretty standard. Um, and the age distribution was pretty centered. It was a pretty normal distribution around about 50 years old. So based on job function, we did get a lot of wildlife biologists, 45%. About 14% fisheries biologists, 14 in education and outreach, 15% were leadership, and then all other roles made up about 12%. So looking at the results for those, the first question where I asked folks, how important are each of these key priorities? We see that most priorities are pretty important, which is good. Um, so looking at this graph, it's, this is a scale from one to seven. One is not at all important, seven is very important. We only displayed four because everything was above four. So 71.1% of respondents indicated that increasing the likelihood of success for multi-state species was a very important goal. So those percentages are all the folks that said, this is a level seven to me, this is very important. So there is a bit of a decline, but still 50% of people said that uh, climate change, which was rated with the lowest priority overall, was still very important to them. So looking at those group comparisons, we did not see a lot of differences based on groups here. Uh, I know this is a bit of a funky table, but you have in this variable column, that's just the group that we split it by. Uh, group one and group two are the two options for what you can be. And then in the center, there's either gonna be an equal sign, a less than and a greater than sign to tell you which way the trend is going. Um, so the notable exceptions here for time in the field, uh, those that had been in the field for less than 20 years were significantly more likely to uh, rank climate change as a higher priority. Those that were not white ranked describing threats to species in their habitats as a higher priority. And then for the gender split, uh, women and other genders were rated, sorry, rated climate change as a higher priority. So moving on to objective, objective two, we wanted to describe the extent of current and future collaborations. Uh, regular participation was kind of across the board. Uh, again, we have a similar order to each of these core conservation goals. Describing threats to species and habitats is now switched places with increasing the likelihood of success for species with multi-state ranges. Um, working with diverse stakeholders is in the middle. At the, the last one, it was actually further down. And then again, down at the bottom, we have developing plans to adapt conservation actions to climate change. And once again, these percentages beside the bars here indicate the percentage of respondents that indicated the highest level for this question. So 37.7% of respondents said they regularly participated in describing threats to species in their habitats. Looking at future interest in regional collaborations, it uh, looks a little better. Folks are all pretty interested, even if they aren't doing collaborations across. Uh, so increasing likelihood of success is once again at the top, 63.4% of respondents indicated they were very interested in doing that. Down at, towards the bottom, again, we have working with diverse stakeholders, protecting land and increasing connectivity and developing plans to adapt conservation actions to climate change. The good news here, though, is that most of the means for these were above the interested line. So everyone was either somewhat interested or very interested in participating in these collaborations. So breaking this down by group, we had a lot more variation than we did on the last one. This is for current participation and collaborations. Leadership roles. Leadership are participating at least the folks we talk to, are participating more often than their non-leadership counterparts. Those that have been in the field more than 20 years are participating in collaborations more often. There was really not any difference based on race, but again, we did have a largely white sample. And then we had males participating more often for most goals. Again, very male sample. And for government type, or sorry, employer type, this is where we looked at government versus non-government employees. We found that folks that don't work for government agencies that answered our survey are participating more frequently on most of these goals than those that do work for the government. All right, future interest in collaborations. So we had pretty even spread here. Leadership and non-leadership were about the same. Uh, 
Time and field didn't have an effect on future interest. Neither did race. Uh, females indicated they were more interested in participating in collaborations. And then again, uh, we didn't see very much variation based on employer type. Uh, but going back up, we did see for a specific goal, leadership felt more strongly about increasing the likelihood of success for species with multi-state ranges. And then those that had been in the field for less than 20 years had a greater interest in describing threats to species in their habitats. So this is one of my favorite parts is looking at the benefits and the barriers of collaboration. If we're looking at the survey items we tested for benefits, the top, top rated benefit is increasing conservation success for multi-state species. And that's been the theme throughout. And I think that's because it's a broad goal that is agreeable. Um, it's the ultimate goal is we want to increase the likelihood of conservation success. But sharing data and information surprised me here. 68.9% uh, of respondents said that that was very important. Um, apparently there is a dearth of information sharing going on and that's something we need to work on. The saving time, sharing costs and saving money were also pretty important to folks. And then making my boss and agency happy was not the most important thing. So I also had a short response for this and I asked people in their words to tell me what they thought the top benefits for collaborations were. A lot of the themes that came out through this is that species, habitats, populations, and their ranges are going to span political borders and it's silly to try and manage them within political borders, but that's kind of just the system we have and that we're working within. Uh, they also said that collaborations are great for sharing knowledge. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. And then managing at a population scale or taking a landscape level approach is just the way to go. Moving on to barriers, uh, the top barrier we found according to participants was that it's just too expensive and the logistics are too difficult. This makes sense. These are the ones that are most commonly cited in the literature on collaborations. Uh, but the time input and then the lack of boss and agency support were also up. Uh, data and information sharing was not as large of a barrier to folks as I thought it would be given how much of a benefit it was. And then it stirs up controversy is apparently not the worst barrier, but is a barrier. So it is something that should be addressed. So looking at the barriers, the qualitative responses, the biggest thing I found here was that organizations just have different pri priorities. Um, getting these different organizations that have different missions, different goals, and different ways of doing things to cooperate and to um, cohesively work together towards a common goal is a really difficult thing to do. Lack of funding, as always in conservation, was also another concern. And then the, just the politics, um, government red tape, different legislative goals, and people's egos uh, were another top barrier to cooperation. So jumping back to benefits real quick, looking at group differences, the only real difference between uh, those that had been in the field for less than 20 years and more than 20 years was that the younger respondents indicated that data and information sharing was a greater benefit than their older counterparts. We also found that females thought data and information sharing was a greater benefit as along with increasing the success of multi-state species. Jumping over to the barriers now, if we're looking at those differences by group, not a whole lot of difference between leadership of time and field. They were pretty cohesive on those. Um, for race, white professionals saw logistics as being a greater barrier than their non-white counterparts. Um, and that was statistically significant, which I thought was interesting. And I'd like to dig a little more into that at a later date. And then for gender, we did have females seeing a lack of boss and agency support as a greater barrier. Uh, but again, we did have few women in the survey, and so I'm curious how it could have affected this. So some key takeaways from this regional collaboration section. Our top priorities, we want to increase the likelihood of conservation success. Uh, we want to describe the rest of species and their habitats, but we're not putting as much emphasis on climate change and diversity issues. Our practitioners really value managing things at a landscape level, and some of the greatest barriers that we face are high expense and different organizational priorities. All right, let's talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and wildlife conservation. All right, so again, we ran a test for non-response bias. We did chi-squared, and uh, kind of a wave analysis didn't see a whole lot of differences. When I forgot to mention, 
So all of this was in one big survey. And I had filter questions that told folks, you know, have you worked on GEI projects in a cross-state manner? And if they said yes, they got these questions. And if they said no, it skipped them down to, to a different set of questions. So this is all one big giant survey that people took. And then um, analysis wise, we again did descriptive statistics and looked at those group types again, followed up by a social network analysis. So reminding us of our objectives, we wanted to determine the extent of collaborations around diversity, equity and inclusion in the Southeast. So the first question was, what's going on? Is anybody doing DEI work? So we looked at the perceived efficacy of in-state and cross-state DEI projects, and then the likelihood of future participation in those projects. And these were all Likert scale questions. So for efficacy, we found that in-state collaborations are perceived to be a little bit more effective than those cross-state collaborations, but not by very much. And the overall sentiment was that they're kind of effective, uh, based on the means at least. They're not seven, so they're not extremely effective and they're not one, so they're not pointless. But it looks like we've got a lot of room for improvement with these collaborations around DEI. So we look at who answered these questions. Um, we had a lot of men and a lot of women um, that were interested or likely to participate. So for females, 84.3% said they were likely to participate in these collaborations. And about 70% said that they of men said that they were interested. And this lines up with a lot of our previous uh, responses based on the distribution between men and women. So age-wise, there really wasn't a big difference. About 65% of each said they were likely. And then by role, leadership and boots on the ground folks were pretty consistent. They were both pr pretty highly interested. So the mean score for this was 4.65 on that same seven point Likert scale which is good, I think. But that means that the mean, most people are likely to participate. So we also asked folks about their motivations. That's great, you told me you participate in these collaborations, can you tell me why? Uh, and so we had a different list of potential motivations. Again, we worked with um, the CECAS lead steering team and the climate change into swap group for these, but I also consulted with a couple of DEI folks around the region that I knew. Um, David Bugs helped me out on this, uh, in particular over at Texas uh, Parks and Wildlife, um, kind of nailing down some of the most important reasons to collaborate. And so looking at these motivations, our top motivation is to better serve diverse stakeholders, um, improving inclusivity and planning, enhancing programming, uh, improving information sharing were also some good benefits. There were a lot of people that felt strongly that there was a personal responsibility to do these collaborations. Increasing funding and fundraising potential was also up there. Um, other was actually a short response where people could fill in the blank. And those were usually some variation on the theme of its personal responsibility. A lot of that was, I wanna increase representation. I want to inspire the next generation of wildlife professionals, things in that sort of vein. And then finally, down at the bottom, there is the, because my boss said I had to, the organizational DEI mandate. And once again, my percentages here are those percent of respondents that said a reason was very important to collaborate. All right, so now is my social network analysis question. So the way I set this up, these are roster questions. I have three big categories. I group them into government entities, NGOs and nonprofits, um, and corporations and co-ops. And so they had a big long list, there were check boxes, and they would go through and check off everybody that you've worked with. Have you worked with the Department of Defense on a DEI collaboration? Yes, I have. Have you worked with the American Fisheries Society? No, I haven't, move on. And then we also had a free response question where we said, okay, if there's somebody else that wasn't on our list, who did you work with? Can you tell us? So switching gears a little bit, I'm going to give you a bit of a background on social network analysis, and then we're going to dive into the actual results. So social network analysis is a method of quantifying relationships. It's based on graph theory, and it's a great way to visualize who is working with whom. Um, so each point in a network is going to be called an actor, and that can be a person, it can be a group of people, or it can be an organization. And each line is going to indicate a relationship between people. And these relationships can mean that information is moving, funding is moving, resources are flowing through these relationships. 
And then we can look at the number of connections people have, look at the strength of those connections and how often they occur. And then we can learn a lot about where resources are in the network and how we can change things. So again, we saw this collaboration graphic earlier. I made it, I spent a lot of time on it, guys. Um, this is just an example of what a collaboration could look like. So this is my first hairball. Uh, that's not its actual name. This is the full network structure of regional DEI collaborators in the Southeast. So at this point, people had gone through a skip pattern. And if you said, yes, I worked on a cross-state DEI collaboration, then you got those check boxes and you answered the roster questions about who you'd worked with. So all these folks over here are organizations that fell off the list because nobody checked their box. These are called isolates in social network analysis and essentially they're dead. They don't, they're not connected to the network, at least not in the network of people we talked to. These were largely minority serving non-governmental organizations and conservation NGOs. So looking down here at the bottom right of the screen, you see my color coordination. Um, government agencies are this yellowy color. Pink are gonna be NGOs. Those are primarily conservation NGOs. Think Ducks Unlimited, the Nature Conservancy. And then we have purple for minority serving NGOs. Those are gonna be things like MINRIC Outdoor Afro. Um, and blue is corporations, uh, Bass Pro, uh, RAI. Partnerships are orange. There's a couple of them sprinkled in. Those are gonna be things like the Southeast Aquatic Resources Partnership. So these are just the connected actors. We got rid of those isolates and the network's a little smaller. Right now we have 121 nodes and like over 3000 ties. So whenever I was going through doing my analysis, I said, so how quickly do people drop off? Are people not connected to this network very well? We cut down the network by almost half by raising the requirement from one connection, which is this graph, to two connections. So it is a big network. It's larger than I thought it would be, but it very quickly drops in size. So these are pairs of actors with more than two ties. So um, these data are undirected, which means that the line indicates simply the presence or absence of relationships. So it's not saying, um, you know, Ducks Unlimited works with U.S. Fish and Wildlife and U.S. Fish and Wildlife works with Ducks Un Duck Unlimited. It just says, yes, they work together. So pairing it down a little bit more, we get to the core network structure. I just started upping the box. I just clicked the button a bunch of times to see when does the network start to look different? When can I pull out those key core actors that are doing the most collaborations with one another? And so I got to about 24, 25, and I ended up with, I think this is 10 collaborators. Um, and so the sizing here is a little bit different too. The sizing is based on degree centrality. Centrality is a power measure that here in its simplest form is just your number of connections. So the biggest connect, or the biggest node here, the biggest circle is going to be U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service because they have the highest degree centrality in this network. And then the smallest key network actor here is going to be NRCS because compared to U.S. US Fish and Wildlife, they don't have a high degree centrality, but compared to the rest of the network, they do. So these are our core actors, and we, we notice about them that they are all government or conservation NGOs. U.S. Fish and Wildlife in particular is connected to a lot of people. All the state fish and wildlife agencies are connected. U.S. Forest Service is hanging in there. And then the Wildlife Society is doing pretty good as well. But I will note, we talked to members of the Wildlife Society and the American Fisheries Society. So that could be a little bit of influence there. So this is called a circle graph. This is a different way of envisioning the core network players where you can see who's connected to who based on a, di a different tie metric, essentially. So in our previous graph, I'm going the wrong way. There we go. In our previous graph, each of these lines could be valued, but you can't see that because it's two dimensional. There could be 50 lines stacked there that you just don't see. But here we've spread out, we've, we've fanned them out so that you can see how many ties are happening. And you see that US Fish and Wildlife has a lot of ties between each of these other actors. So each of these lines indicates 25 ties. So who are we working with? We're working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They're working with Forest Service. AF was in there, NRCS, 
universities, those state fish and wildlife agencies again. It's the same key players. So what are some takeaways from all of this? Going back to the um, qualitative or the other part of the survey, practitioners were largely interested in DEI work. Our younger folks seemed a little more interested than their older counterparts, and a lot of the motivations that they indicated were intrinsically intrinsic motivations. Um, sort of the expected players are reinforcing the status quo here with the DEI collaborations. Again, it's the government agencies, it's the large conservation NGOs, and they're not really connected with those minority serving NGOs or those partnerships that are potentially better suited to be doing this work. And then finally, there's just a huge potential for network growth here and lots of opportunity to create new partnerships with different types of organizations. Um, there is, it's really exciting. There's so much potential to get these different people talking to each other because they are talking. They're just not talking enough. The key actors are talking amongst themselves in a crowded room and they're not expanding. It's like they're at the conference and they're crowded around the coffee table. They're all putting the same amount of cream and sugar and there's everybody around them, but they're just not turning around. So this is a infographic that I created uh, for the last two chapters of my thesis. I wanted to do something a little bit more digestible for folks. Um, so I created two infographics. If you scan the QR code, um, it'll bring you up one on your phone that you can zoom in. I know it's kind of small on the screen. These are just some key takeaways from the first first chapter of my thesis about regional collaborations in general. And then the next slide will be about some collaborations, particularly around DEI. I'm going to go ahead and switch that. We can send these slides out afterwards if you guys really want them. So here's the DEI infographic. And again, we have that key circle graph showing those network players that are all government and all conservation organizations. So looking forward, some broader impacts. We can use this research to inform funding and resource allocation. Um, we can enhance DEI and wildlife conservation by encouraging new connections and encouraging more collaborations. And then by identifying these key players in the collaborative space, we can find new places to create connections, create new bridges, and to bring more people to the table. So before the last conference I attended, I sat down with AI and asked it to generate some images of conservation. And they all looked like this. So my challenge to us is that in the next few years, we'll be able to not only change the wildlife field, but the conservation field in general enough, and then hopefully have a trickle effect to AI to where conservation is a little bit more than just old white men and scary nightmare deer. So with that, I'll say thank you. Um, I've got my collaborators listed up here because again, it is a collaborative research project and I'd love to take some questions.